Hi, I'm Father Mitch Packlin. Tonight on EWTN Live, we're going to hear about some new things happening in the ongoing struggle to protect life around the world, more specifically on the continent of Africa. But first, we want to hear also about some new things coming your way on EWTN television next month. Here to tell us about it is EWTN's Vice President of Programming and Production, Mr. Peter Gagnon, and the Director of Program Acquisitions and Co-Productions, Mr. John Elson. Gentlemen, how are you all doing? Thank you, doing great. Good. Good. Good to be with you. And Peter, what, yeah. what do we got going on next, yeah. next month? Well, thank you for having us on and sure. for letting us use this opportunity to kind of inform our viewers of some of the things that happen. I know you do that with Jack frequently. So, um, But next month, one of the biggest things is your new program, um, Threshold of Hope, is now becoming uh, scripture and tradition with Father Mitch. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been asked for a long time by our viewers for a Bible study, and we said, what better person than Father Mitch? And the beauty of it is that uh, people will be able to follow at home, um, getting your book, winning the uh, the battle against sin, yes. and I think get that through catalog, and they'll be able to follow along the Bible study that you're going to lead mm -hmm. every week. It'll be a call-in show, so people can ask questions, and uh, that's really we're really excited about that one. I, I know you are as well. Um, the other things we're doing is is every once in a while we'll make changes to our programming grid and our lineup, um, and and some of the things we're doing is uh, we're going to create programming blocks, and um, and we'll make some changes to some of our programming. For example, Jim and Joy at Home and Jim and Joy is going to be reformatted to a, to a half hour pro segment, but it'll be three times a week instead of just oh, two yes. times a week. So it'll expand, and that'll be um, one of the entries in our, in our family um, oriented programming block. So we'll Kay. have Jim and Joy, Eat or Ten Pro-Life Weekly, Praying as a Family. So every Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. families can tune in and, and get, um, get programming geared towards them and their Kay. families every Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. We're going to follow that with a new Marian programming block. So Monday through Friday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, um, you'll be able to, our viewers will be able to get a, a different program on Our Lady. So from Our Lady of Scripture and Tradition to Scott Hahn's series, Hail Holy Queen, to other series in, in a new uh, program that we just uh, are going to debut called um, Total Consecration um, to Mary through Je to Jesus through Mary. Good, good, good. And then um, the other ones we're going to have is a, a programming block geared towards men. So that'll, that'll be in the evenings. And um, so we'll have Doug Berry on there, um, nice. uh, Crossing the Goal, um, Justin Fatika. So all those programs, mm -hmm. 11 p.m. at night, men can tune in and get programming that will really um, lift them spiritually and continue to fortify their Catholic faith. Cool. And then on the weekends, yeah. we'll have an apologetics block. We just know our viewers love apologetics, so we'll have uh, Saturday afternoons. You can get a couple hours of uh, ap apologetic programming. The other thing we were looking at is um, not March, but April. We're going to be um, continuing Sunday Night Prime. You know, Father Apostoli passed away. Right. But the CFRs are going to continue that program. Um, it's going to be reformatted a little bit with some of the younger friars, so people should look for that in April as well. And um, we're just going to continue to bring the major events. You know, later this summer, there's um, World Meeting of Families. In, um, in Dublin and, uh, you know, the upcoming canonization of Paul VI. So we continue to be able to bring these events through the generosity of our viewers. Um, and those are just some of the highlights. I know John mm. wants to talk about some of the new programs. Well, programs. you know, my father, as you know, Mother Angelica used to always tell us that God wants us to be great saints. And uh, each week in our cinema slot, which airs on Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, we offer a movie uh, about a saint uh, whose example gives us great encouragement. On March 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be premiering a new movie about uh, St. Ignatius, someone who's dear to all of our hearts, great yes. founder of the Jesuit order, and that's Ignatius, uh, soldier, sinner, saint. That's it on March 10th. We'll also be premiering a new series about the Holy Spirit entitled The uh, Wild Goose, uh, a new series uh, produced by Our Faith in Action, produced by the Vincensans, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. And at this time, as we speak, Christophonic is producing a second series of our popular Real Life Catholic series. And we also uh, are in production right now of a new uh, movie, EW10 original movie and docudrama about Mother Cabrini. And we have actually a trailer uh, to share with our audience. Yeah, let's uh, yeah. take a look at that trailer that we have from that uh, uh, show.
right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for letting us know about this stuff. We look forward to these programmings coming up on EWTN. And there's a lot to look forward to tonight as well. So please stay right here at EW10 Live because we have a great guest coming up for us. to welcome welcome you know uh, now we'll get back to the regular programming our guest tonight uh, as i always say our guests are from all over the world well she, she's from far away she is an international pro-life speaker and the founder of the culture of life africa which seeks to promote and defend the african values of life marriage motherhood and family life She's also the author of a new book called Target Africa, Ideological Neocolonialism of the 21st Century. Now, this book documents the secular agenda of radical feminism, population control, sexualization of children, and homosexuality that is being pushed on African nations today. So please welcome Obianuju Ikiocha. Thank you, Father. How are you? Welcome, welcome, <laughs> Thank welcome. You. Thank you so much, Father, for having me on. This is really exciting for me. Now, the, I always, again, as I mentioned, I like to say how we have international guests. You are originally from Nigeria. which country? Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah, so but you don't live there right now. No. You live in? In the United Kingdom. And I have lived in the United Kingdom for about 12 years now. Yes. Uh, but I was born and raised in Nigeria, in the southeastern part of Nigeria. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I, I still keep going back home, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes more than once a year even to do, you know, in the course of my work or sometimes to see uh, members of my family. Uh, so, yeah, it has yeah. really been a... A very adventurous uh, journey for me uh, doing this pro-life work. Well, one of the other <laughs> things too is not only do you live in the United Kingdom, but you live near their Birmingham. Yes. And now you've come <laughs> over to our Birmingham. That is true. I live th about 20 or 30 miles south of the real Birmingham. No, this is real. <laughs> this isn't an illusion. The real Birmingham. Uh -huh. uh, so, and I actually a lot of I, I do a lot of work out there in the church, and, and uh, I belong to a parish in Birmingham. So I go to the oratory. Oh, uh, yes. yes. You know, Blessed John Henry yes. Newman. So yes, uh, that that is my life, and it's very exciting for me now to be in Birmingham today. Day, so. <laughs> Good to have you. Now, something also for our, our folks to understand. You, your background, your academic background is in science. You're doing scientific research in Great Britain, correct? Yeah, so actually I do diagnostic work. Uh, so I work as a biomedical scientist, mm -hmm. and I have done for all of these years. Uh, when I came to the United Kingdom, actually originally I came to do my master's in biomedical science in one of the universities in London. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, now I, I do work as a scientist, still continue working as a scientist, uh, but for about five years now, I have also been very involved in the pro-life movement. Well, I think it's important to see that this is an application of important aspects of science well, that will be there to save lives and families and integrity. You know, science is obviously very helpful. Absolutely. There is a, a perfect uh, agreement, I would say, between my pro-life work and my work as a scientist. You know, uh, when one talks about cells, because I spend all day looking at, at uh, you know, the human cells, the blood cells, there is no way anybody would look at something like an ultrasound, for example, and not say this is a human life or this is a human being. So there is really perfect agreement and no contradiction whatsoever in, in between my pro-life work and my, my professional
professional work as a scientist. So mm. uh, it's always very fulfilling for me to know that I am what I'm doing is actually pro-science as a pro-life person. Uh, so to be pro-life is actually to be pro-science with especially with the medical advancements we have now it's uh, quite amazing how all the advancements happening in the western world especially that that anybody in the western world could think that abortion is okay when on the other hand uh, you know things like neonatology uh, ultrasounds we we are getting more and more advanced and more and more we are seeing that the baby in the womb is a baby you know precisely so no one can deny that and and it's very, very satisfying and fulfilling for me to do both. Yes, yeah. it's a, a very important kind of work. But the, what you are specifically doing, with it, and this is why I wanted to bring up where you're from and where you live now, as well as some of your other work, because uh, you address the United Nations right. and uh, with, with your expertise and such. Um, you are therefore well aware of uh, this neo-colonialism. Colonialism mm -hmm. referred to the um, tendency of powerful nations yes. to take over less powerful nations yes. as colonies. That's, yeah. that's a very ancient practice. Uh, it was done all over the world by anybody who had the power to do so. That is right. And in, in Africa, the old colonialism was First, to get human cargo, slaves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and about 12 million Africans were brought to this continent and a few million more up to the Turkish Empire. Mm -hmm. um, then also, uh, after slavery was over, going to Africa for the resources. Exactly. You know, they, they wanted the gold, diamonds uh, from South Africa and elsewhere, all that. But now you're talking about that, that's the old colonialism. Yes. And Africans have more say over their countries and resources. Yes, yeah, so precisely the book that you had mentioned, The Target Africa, which I wrote that just came out a few days ago, uh, I started it off by explaining uh, the colonialism of a hundred years ago, which uh, many people might already know about the fact that a lot of the African countries were colonized by Great Britain, for example. Uh, there were so many countries that were also colonized by France. Countries like Belgium, even Portugal, even Spain uh, took over some of the African countries. And Germany? And Germany. 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 But after, I think after first first world war uh, they lost their grip on on the African countries that they were colonizing right. but Africa has been a, 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 a very much a colonized continent up until the 1960s in mm -hmm. fact it was at the end of the Second World War when the Atlantic Charter came out the United States and Churchill uh, were trying to work out what what you know what the how the world would would be from then on that they came to an agreement that people should self-govern so we've come to an end of that first colonial, uh, colonialistic era, I'd say, that from about 1958, 1960, a lot of the African countries got their independence. But unfortunately, what is happening now in the last, say, 40 years is that there, is, there has now risen another type of colonialism where more powerful countries, but not only countries now, but more powerful organizations and entities and even philanthropists are coming into African countries. And they are using the same playbook that was was used a hundred years ago to uh, colonize Africa to take over so many things around the continent but in a way that is uh, so very dangerous because people don't even realize in some cases that ideologically uh, these more powerful countries more powerful uh, you know foundations and organizations coming with lots of money that they are dictating for us in many ways uh, what the ideology should be or they are trying to to mask or cover or eclipse what would be our uh, cultural views and values, and, and that's what I uh, go a great length to describe as ideological uh, neocolonialism. A lot of people have talked about it. Even the Holy Father, uh, at several occasions, had, had, has also talked about it, especially going to the developing world. Uh, some of his speeches have had that statement where, you know, Western nations are colonizing the de developing countries. Uh, so I try to explain it in the book, uh, Target Africa. I, you know, my own analysis is that in the, you know, uh, the, the last few hundred years, mm -hmm. because the Portuguese and the Spanish were colonizing back in the 15th century, and then the others came later. But it was because the Africans were technologically further behind the Europeans, and the Europeans 
did so because they could. Yes. But now they don't need Africans for labor. Mm -mm. They don't. They, they don't need as much of the resources. Exactly. That again, they can't control that. Yes. And. This almost seems like an attempt to make sure Africa stays weak by not allowing the population and family life to stay strong. And that would give the West an edge through ideology. Well, Does you, that make sense? This is perfect sense, Father. So uh, one of the most uh, obvious things about a lot of the African countries, a lot of the African cultures, is that no matter the situation that people find themselves, the most resilient thing about us is our family culture, mm -hmm. is the way people take families, the way you know, people's understanding of marriage. No matter what the Africans are saying, they know, you know, male-female complementarity is quite core. Marriage is core to society. Families are foundational in society. You know, something like the sanctity of human life is celebrated across the different African continents. Nobody's confused about that. So these are the strengths within our societies and from these we can actually build up ourselves. Like but, I, I was going to say if, yes. if a young couple yes. finds out that they're going to have a baby during yes. the first year of their marriage does that make them sad? Absolutely not. We are thanking God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're thanking God. On the contrary, what some of the most difficult things that happen within African societies, and no one actually talks about this, is infertility. Uh, if a woman finds herself uh, having difficulties to conceive, that is one of the most painful things that can happen, happen to a woman in Africa. So it's the way we take motherhood and the way we celebrate motherhood and the way couples accept the gift of children uh, is something so, it's so beautiful to behold. Hold. But the people coming with lots of money, they are coming with their gifts, they are telling us something different. What, what people? What, when you say the, the people, people, who yeah. is coming with lots of money and gifts? Great question. So I put them in three classes. I say it's the nations, the organizations, and the foundations. So the countries will be uh, the, some of the. So the nations, let's talk about so the, the nations. So the nations, you know, the, they are the major players. So the United States, um, especially during the last administration, during the Obama administration, unfortunately, uh, they came in with a lot of money through USAID and they did a lot of projects that were very objectionable, I'd say. Uh, the, you know, country like United Kingdom, uh, even other countries like Germany, you know, Sweden, a lot of the countries who give money to Africa under the auspices of foreign aid. Well, so, well, well okay, so that we understand this, I, th I think it's uh, to spell some of this out. Yes. When you say that the United States gave aid, look, Yes. Trying to, we're trying to help. Absolutely. What was the problem with trying to help with uh, the, the USAID? Yeah, and that's the thing. Aid is, you know, on the outset looks like a really good thing. It's mm -hmm. good to, to go and help the poor, especially when you see the pictures of all these hungry children, you know, women suffering. Yes, aid can be good. But then what West, some of the Western nations do is that they get to these relationships with African countries where the African countries sometimes become uh, I would call it addicted to aid, so I called it aid addiction and high dependency on aid that if that aid wasn't there, sometimes the African country may not be able uh, to sustain itself. At least that is the thought of some of the African leaders. So they come in with aid, but then those aids sometimes can be can have strings attached. So when giving aid to the African countries, why don't you allow them to say what they would choose the aid for? Uh, you know, people would choose something like education. People would choose to build up their healthcare systems. People would choose to build up infrastructure. But that's not the kind of aid we're seeing now. More and more, we are seeing aid for what they are calling population programs. That further, in the last uh, let's say 20, 25 years, during my investigation trying to write the book Target Africa, I found out that the increase in foreign aid specifically tagged for population programs, which would be condoms, contraception, and even in some cases abortion, increased in 20 years by 1,930%. So, you know, it's not 100% increase, increase. It's, it's 1,930 percent. So over increase. almost 20 times exactly. as much money is given by the United States, Great Britain, and other countries yeah to stop Africans from having babies. Yes, just for population programs. And this is all from their own documentation, their own tracking system, that population uh, aid given to African nations has now exceeded uh, any money given to African nations for education, for water and sanitation, for you know social amenities. 
it is unbelievable mm -hmm. and sometimes you wonder why are they spending so much money why are they wasting the money because they're bringing the aid but they're not allowing the Africans to choose what the aid will be used for they are dictating to us and they are dictating to African leaders this is where we want the money used for they are using it for population control they're using it to hyper sexualize African youth they are using it to bring in you know uh, unsolicited things like condom programs for children in different African countries they are giving it to abortion providing organizations like uh, you know International Planned Parenthood Federation Marie Stopes International which is a British organization so these these people are qualifying for aid and a lot of the Western countries are flocking to them and giving them money as well so the nations are great players here and I call them the neo-colonial masters uh, so who have taken the place of our old colonial masters they are the foundations like the Gates Foundation the Hugh Lev is this Fund. the Gates from uh, Microsoft yes that's right the same Gates from Microsoft so Bill Gates Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, and Melinda Gates his have wife. gone into, uh, they're, they're re really big now on the foreign aid scene, but then uh, they are also some of the biggest drivers of population and contraception projects across the different African countries and even beyond, you know, other parts of the developing world. Yes. So the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, uh, Judge Soros's organization called the Open Society, they're also George very Soros? big. Yeah, Judge okay. Soros, who runs the Open Society, but if anyone would check, Open Society does quite a lot of funding in Africa, uh, you know, things on homosexuality, they are funding these projects, things on transgenderism, them in African countries where no one is asking for these things but then they are allocating millions of dollars to these uh, let me call them fringe projects just because those fringe projects uh, match up with their own ideology um, it's very objectionable uh, it's very unfortunate I remember that when President Obama went I think to Kenya mm -hmm. and uh, they he and the president of Kenya were lecturing each other back and forth about the, the President Obama wanted to increase money for uh, promoting uh, homosexuality that's to right. be allowed and the president of Kenya say that's not our values. That's right. You are talking about the press conference, that press conference that President Obama did with President Jumo Kenyatta who uh, is the, the president of Kenya where they talked back and forth uh, about you know LGBT rights and all whatnot and he has done this not only in Kenya he has also done it in Senegal. Uh, he keeps you know at the time he did it at every opportunity that he got especially when he was in, in Africa but not only that when you uh, read through everything that happened through the State Department during the time that President Obama was the president of the United States uh, you would see how much bullying went into uh, the Obama foreign policy uh, foreign aid policy when it came to things like like LGBT you know LGBT propaganda and and what the United States did all over the developing world it's actually quite shameful that I know that a lot of Americans who may not have known that but uh, just for people to know that the United States uh, as a country has gone out and foreign policy has gone out in the name of the American people uh, you know pushing values that everybody would or most people would object to yeah and you know um, it, it's certainly we've been critical of the way Planned Parenthood has targeted African Americans yes. But this is the government using international Planned Parenthood and other organizations to target African Africans. Precisely. So you, uh, IPPF, which is International Planned Parenthood Federation, ha have branches in, I think, 42 countries in sub-Saharan Africa alone. So they are almost in every African country. Uh, Marie Stopes International has branches in 16 African countries. When you get on ground, you would find out that these organizations have clinics, even in rural places where there is no water and there is no electricity. But they are going into the these places they are giving family planning to the women but what is worse is that they are using mobile clinics they are inserting into women things like IUD the intrauterine device and they're leaving these women and sometimes when these women in rural parts of Africa have things like side effects they have nowhere to turn to they have nobody to go to sometimes they can't even go to a doctor to have these devices removed from them so when you look at it closely we might actually find that there, there could be some human rights abuses happening in the name of uh, of the you know Western people, Western taxpayers, because they're going with American money, they're going with British you know British pounds, and they are going into Africa, and this is what they are promoting as 
uh, you know, Western development or, or progress or, you know, but, but it's all terrible. The United Nations has also become uh, quite a major player in some of these. Well, why would they? have anything to do with that? What, what's right. the United Nations up to? So the United Nations, we always have, you know, a lot of us have always thought of the United Nations as the arbiter of, of, of morality, or they have the strong moral voice. But unfortunately... And, and it's peacemakers. That, 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 peacemakers. that was the, the goal of the United oh, Nations, the, to have dialogue the United, for that's the nations right. to avoid war. Exactly. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. Now, the United Nations, unfortunately, has now, in recent years, again, uh, aligned its itself with, with some of the most liberal Western nations. Uh, it's not just that they're aligning themselves with Western nations, but they are choosing just those uh, most controversial things, the most controversial streaks, to, uh, and they're using it as a platform to move and globalize uh, these values. So abortion rights is, is a big deal among uh, a certain, uh, you know, some of the most powerful people within the United Nations. There is an organization, an agency within the UN called UN Women, and that agency agency is already pro-abortion. You know, they have taken a stand for abortion. Mm -hmm. Even an organization like World Health Organization that is meant to be neutral, they are meant to be taking care of, you know, the, the health of, of people around the world. But they especially are... Especially the vulnerable, the especially poor. The vulnerable. You know, So, I mean, Africa certainly has had a terrible problem with malaria. It's a yes. major killer oh, yes. in, throughout Africa and yes. other diseases that the medicine isn't always available. Yes. And but the World Health Organization has taken a pro-abortion uh, stance. So I go to the, to the United Nations every year, at least for the last couple of years. And each time I go, it's always a shock to me and a disappointment that the World Health Organization is promoting what they call safe abortion. Uh, but we know that there is nothing like safe abortion because it's not safe for the baby who is being aborted, by the way. But the UN actually has a guideline that they call the guideline to providing safe abortions. And they are also recommending to countries that don't have legal abortion to legalize abortion. So in most of the African countries do not have legal abortion. I think about four African countries have legalized abortion, what you call abortion on demand. But most of the other African countries have either uh, made abortion illegal or you know it's really, really restricted in those countries. But every time that the nations gather under this uh, great uh, institution called the United Nations, they are getting recommendations to legalize abortion uh, and they are promote you know these are being these horrible values are being promoted as if it's good for women as if it's safer for women as if it's what Africans need to do in order to to stop like, you know maternal mortality and things like that so we're seeing it all the time and we are trying to fight it everywhere we can well this is um, a very important work and I uh, I'm glad you inform us about it I, I've mentioned over the years because I remember uh, uh, during mr. Clinton's uh, you know, uh, term as president, yes. they were doing the same thing. Um, I, I was more pleased with President Bush, mm -hmm. who was much more committed to making sure that medicine to counteract AIDS yes. was getting to people. Right. They were making that more cheap, and, they, and that's continued. As a matter of fact, he and President, former President Clinton, mm -hmm. have worked together in getting medicine for AIDS. Still, they're both doing that. Uh, and I commend them for that. But it was, uh, you know, the, we saw that with President Obama and President Clinton. And I think we, we Americans need to take uh, a, a stance. We did so when uh, we supported the apartheid policy, well, at least the, the government of South Africa that promoted apartheid. And many Americans rightly stood against apartheid yes. and disinvested in South Africa because of the evil of yes. apartheid. But we also have to make sure that it's not a solution to say to Africans, well, okay, you're, you're equal with the whites, so long as we, you let us kill your babies. Exactly. Easy, that, that's wrong. Yeah, so something like abortion is being promoted mostly by, by Western countries. Yeah. Uh, and and the way, as you say, people completely um, separated themselves with, from the apartheid that was going on. Everybody said, "We will not be a part of this." Right. They should come. People should rise up now because they exactly. and they should know that Western countries are funding abortion providing organizations in Africa. So the Mexico City policy. I don't know if people know about the Mexico City policy, whereby uh, Reagan started it, and and since then, uh, you know that that means that American government will not fund abortion providing organizations uh, in any way in their 
in the international work. So Reagan, President Reagan did it, and then every time a Democratic president came came through, they would uh, completely remove it. So Clinton removed it, and then they funded abortion. Obama did as well. But now, uh, fortunately, President Trump has reinstated it since January of last year. But since then, we have seen a lot of blowback. We've seen a lot of fighting, a lot of outrage uh, of not the Africans, but of the Western uh, people who had been promoting abortion, uh, you know, f no through aid. Exactly. But what has also happened is a, a country like Canada rising up with their liberal uh, prime minister, and they're coming to, to what they say, they're coming to fill the gap. And Canadian government is now beginning to put in a lot of Canadian dollars uh, into promoting abortion in African countries. And we think that they should stop it. But not only do I think that they should stop it, I believe that uh, a lot of goodwill people should rise up and say no more because this is a form of uh, it's a form of oppression it is a form of neo-colonialism yes thank you we have to take a break but that's i think it's very informative and we want to urge all americans to get all of our politicians to promote life and family uh and let africa be in charge of africa right. help when the, when it's needed but let the Africans make their own decisions. Right. All right, we want you can you can get connected with would you at uh, cultureoflifeafrica.com. So that's one word, cultureoflifeafrica.com, and she has a Twitter. It's at, and I'll spell it out, uh, for, especially for the radio folks, O B I A N U J U. O B I A N U J U. Uh, and you can contact her there as well. We'll take a break, we'll come back with your questions and your comments, so please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, welcome back. Uh, we are talking to Uju about uh, the, the way that Westerners, especially with the more Western secular um, uh, ideologies, are trying to colonize Africa and control Africa, keep it under Western control um, uh, rather than uh, let Africans make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, same thing that they did before with guns and boats, you know, not doing it with the ideas. Yeah. So, you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Let's start off with Mary. Hello, Mary, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Massachusetts. Great, and what is your question? My question is that, uh, I'm sorry, you have a lovely guest and I cannot pronounce her name. But you, can she call you Uju? Yes, yeah, sure. Uju. Well, you, that, exactly. Anyway, <laughs> I, re, I Watching the Pope uh, during his visit to the UN, I noticed that he used a phrase, sustainable development. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if your guest is familiar with that phrase. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I looked it up, and it was um, talking about not only population control, but also natural resource control, mm -hmm. to, even to the point that we, need, we were going to need to use government-approved seeds for the type of, you know, for the ag agricultural that we're going to use. That we're going to plant. So I'm just wondering if she's familiar with that phrase. And sure. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. That's a great question, Mary. So um, 
sustainable development, you, you're familiar with that? Yeah, sure, Father, because uh, before, uh, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, what was being talked about was the Millennium Development Goals. So Millennium Development Goals only just ran out, I think, like two years ago. And since then, they've replaced it with what they're calling the Sustainable Development Goals. This is, you know, uh, the, the UN worked really hard to get to the point where they decided these are the goals we want to promote, especially for the developing world. And yes, uh, what Mary has said is true. There are some things within the Sustainable Development Goals that, uh, that we find actually, you know, quite uh, questionable. Uh, you know, at best, because leading up to them deciding what were these sustainable development goals, I think there's 17, about 17 of them, uh, there were a series of conferences at the UN. Um, I went for some of those conferences. Some of them, we just followed the meetings online to know what was being said. But the pro-life people, the, the um, let's say the movement, the, pro, the arm of the pro-life movement that goes to the UN every year, uh, organizations like CFAM, you know, uh, and so many other organizations, Human Life International, many people, many of us who go to the UN every year, we were telling the UN that if you want to do sustainable development goals, we can have things that we agree on. For example, make one of the goals strengthening the family. So I know that a friend of mine worked so hard to get the UN to put the family, you know, strengthening the family, uh, encouraging the family as one of the sustainable development goals, that did not happen. What made it was uh, women empowerment. Well, when speaking of women empowerment, they're talking about feminism and equality that does not actually um, take note of the fact that women uh, do best or thrive best within marriages, within families, that girls do better when they are in stable homes and stable families, that children do better when they are in homes, you know, uh, headed by father and then with a mother, of course. So they didn't put any of the things that were being suggested by the pro-life arm uh, of, you know, the pro-life movement that goes to the United Nations, but instead some things made it in uh, that had to do with sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, some of the things on environmentalism, of course, uh, but these are the things that have now become the sustainable development goals and anyone can read up on it. Uh, they are a set of documents and they are being promoted uh, by the United Nations. Some things within it are good, like, you know, the end of poverty, education for the child, for, for the girls, you know, all of those things are part of it, but also within it uh, would be things like you know, like comprehensive sexuality education, uh, things on, on, you know, the women and their bodies, so abortion rights and, and all whatnot. So, so any, they're just anybody. Doing the neo colonialism yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, so. Here's my question Why doesn't, uh, isn't it the Organization of African States? Right. Th yes. That's the, that's the, the Af yeah, yeah. yeah, the African, well, they're called the African Union. Okay, African yeah, Union. Yeah, so that's, that's the body, the, uh, all, uh, all African countries together and their, their main Why offices. Why didn't they come up with their own goals? So the African Union uh, is actually very unfortunate, but the African Union, which is run out of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, uh, the leadership of the African Union, let me put it that way, a very friendly to the United Nations and those same crowds uh, that would be at the United Nations because they are recipients of aid. So uh -huh. we are still back to, to that problem. There wouldn't, a there lot would of be the African, no problem though. Of, no, nobody would be taking bribes or any of that, <laughs> would they? Well, even if they're not calling it bribes, is that the African leadership is very unfortunately dependent on aid and they cling to aid. And whoever oh. is giving them so much aid, they will not object to them. So, for example, uh, if a, a Western country comes forward, you know, promoting abortion, the African leaders sometimes just skirt around the issue, skirt around the issue just so that they can get the money. You know, just mm -hmm. let us let us get the funding because these are millions and even sometimes billions of dollars that we're talking about. And that is so important to them. And something like the sustainable development goals that Mary was asking about, uh, attached to the different sustainable development goals are ways of getting funding. So everything is all encoded in that one system. And of course, anybody who wants to get their hands on the money will have to be compliant and that's where the African Union uh, is then weakened. So yes. just back to the point that you made, what is going on between African countries and Western donors is that they are weakening African countries and weakening African leadership to the, to the point that even when we should be defending ourselves, even when we should be promoting our own values, uh, sometimes we are silenced just because we are getting funding.
Yes, yeah, that, that, I saw that going on in Latin America yes. back in the 1970s, and there were bribes. That's what my experience was there, that the politicians were getting a cut. Um, and that may not be the case in Africa, God willing, it's not. But still, the dependence of their economy on Western aid yes. makes them, you know, weak. kowtow and, and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, where are you from? from New Jersey. Great. And your question or comment? I, well, I just have a comment. Uh, 50 years ago, when uh, Pope Paul VI issued Humanae Vitae, I think that yeah, this the, concept... This is the 50th anniversary coming up in be July. It's going to be July, July yeah. of this year, yes. Um, I, I think that this was one of the concepts that he warned against that would happen. And what really saddens me is so much of what he prophesied has come true. Uh, and, and I really think it's an act of the Holy Spirit that the final miracle was just approved and that he's going to be canonized during the year of the 50th anniversary. I think God is trying to tell us something. Yes, hopefully. yes, I think, that, I think that's exactly right. Uh, right. But that, I think that is true, that yes. Pope, uh, Blessed Pope, Paul, Paul VI, VI yes. had this, in, this instinct oh, yes. that, and it was prophetic of uh, what would go on. Yes. Uh, and, not, and it's happened in the West, but now it's also happened with this neo colonial, this new form of co colonization yeah. of Africa. Mm -hmm. Let's take another caller. Hello, Paul. Hi, Father. Paul, yeah, hi. Where are you from? Well, I'm from upstate New York in the Rochester Diocese. Oh, good for you. And uh, I'm very happy for the guest you have tonight. Thank you. Um, what I got, to, first off, I do want to comment to our guest. We have had in our diocese several very good priests from Nigeria helping out in our diocese over the past several years, and we're very thankful, very thankful. Yeah, as a matter of fact, let me just add, pile on that. Uh, all over the country, many priests are coming from Africa. We were missionaries over there, now they're missionaries to us, and it's great reciprocity. Yeah. You got that. Well, what I'm asking, um, I know that we have the entertainment industry in our country that likes to uh, tout up how much they will help those in certain underdeveloped countries or, or emerging countries, and Afro Africa, of course, is one of the primary ones. And I was wondering if our, the guest there ever has talked to somebody like Oprah Winfrey, who we hear so much uh, good mm -hmm. about doing things, mm -hmm. has she ever talked to somebody like her about the kinds of things our government has required them to do in order to get our aid? Well, that, very interesting, because uh, interesting. Uh, Oprah Winfrey does do a lot. She started, yeah. she, she funds started a school, school. yes. In South yeah. Africa. So, so a lot of people, uh, a lot of, um, let's say, stars and people in entertainment, and even sometimes people in sports, uh, are getting into uh, helping people in Africa. Um, even the other day, I heard, you know, one of the musicians has gone to Malawi, and I, I was just watching one of the programs she was doing on education. We see some things that are quite laudable. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people from that industry, a lot of people from those industries in the Western world are also ideologically liberal. And the thing with ideology is that when people believe in, for example, uh, that abortion is is a, is a good thing or is an acceptable thing. They believe that in the West and they are wealthy people and they go out to Africa and they're trying to do the good. Uh, that can many times taint taint what happens or, or their work in Africa. So they go out there and they're trying to run a school or something. Then when what happens when an issue about abortion comes up? Uh, it's you know, it almost strikes me as if they go out with good intentions, but unfortunately, uh, there are these problematic ideologies that they already have uh, that can indeed and many times does affect the way they do their work uh, mm -hmm. when they come into African mm -hmm. communities or societies. Mm -hmm. And people are very religious in most of the African countries. Yes. Uh, but these people coming, how religious are they, you know, and how much appreciative are they of the people's culture and values and what, you know, we don't see, you know, we don't see a lot of that. They come in with a set mind, with an, uh, an already set mind. They come in with a certain um, picture of what they want, and they, you know, and they try to do their work. But uh, it, it can be tainted. It can be tainted with their with their own set ideologies and their own uh, ways. Yeah, it may even be that some people have to pay attention when certain beautiful cakes are brought to you as a gift. It may not be so good. There's a uh, instead of birthday candles, it may be an explosion. That is very true. 
Oh, we have Bill on the line. Bill, where are you calling from? California. Great. Welcome. And what's your question? Do, do poor people use as much resources and cause as much pollution as rich people in, uh, in Brussels and New York who are so worried that uh, the poor people are going to have children? Ah, interesting. That's sort of an environmental question. Yeah, but I know that. Yeah, I, know. It's yeah, a, it's yeah. A, I actually wrote about it in my book, Target Africa. I, I did address that particularly because of the way uh, some people in Western countries were pushing for, you know, for population control and things like that. So I point out an example that um, a person, in a, because there was a guy in, in England, a star, a well-known star, who was uh, saying that, that Ethiopians should reduce their population. And I, I made a point in the book saying that a person in the United Kingdom and a person in Ethiopia, when you compare their carbon footprints, the person in the UK uses 35 times, leaves 35 times more carbon footprint than the person in Ethiopia. Yeah, and that goes for, you know, the, just across the continent that just the electricity that people use and the water people use in Western countries, I mean, not to any, not due to any fault of theirs. That's just the way things are. But people in Africa are not using up as much resources because, you know, we don't have as much resources, as much infrastructure. It, it takes a lot of energy to run the kind of infrastructure that we have. Imagine the amount of electricity used in Los Angeles, for example, could run nations in Africa, you know. Yeah. What would the, the electricity that goes into running California or Los Angeles for one day? I bet you can run African nations perhaps for a month. So it's it's not about if you're checking it by carbon. They do footprint, have a lot of lights on in it, Los Angeles. It, they do. They do. Yeah, a lot of neon signs. <laughs> they do, but that you know, if you if you get down to measuring that, you know, we are not even absorbing anywhere more or leaving more any CO2 emissions. But also, we need to understand that human beings should not be checked by the CO2 emissions that they leave. That every person uh, is here as a gift from God. Every person. Has, in, has value no matter where they are, whether they're living in Los Angeles or whether they're living in Addis Ababa. Uh, we all have this uh, precious uh, gift that God has put within us and we are all here for a mission. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's an important yeah, point. Yeah. We have Linda on the line. Linda, where are you calling from? Ohio. Great, welcome. And what's your question? Well, I wanted to thank her for what she's doing and that she's so beautifully well-spoken. Okay. So thank you. And then I wondered, how she thinks we could turn this around. Okay, so how can this process, whereby the West still thinks yeah. it can control Africa through these ideas and programs, yes. how can this be turned around to, to change things? So there are several things that imperatively must happen for Africa to be decolonized. We must have, first and foremost, economic decolonization of the African countries. The African countries must walk away from aid. I know it seems like an impossible thing, it seems like a difficult thing, but they should, you know, there should be a timeline, there should be a point beyond which nations should begin to say, we will no longer accept aid, say after 2020. 25 or whatever and begin to walk towards it because until the African countries begin to stand to full stature on their own we are going to be dependent on Western countries we are going to be listening to them and we're going to be influenced by them at very critical moments especially when we have to take decisions on on issues of culture and ideology and those influences will be for the good of the Western nations exactly. more than for the for values the, of Africa precisely so they're coming in a paternalistic manner but they're saying we know what is good for you but at the root of it they don't <laughs> they, they don't so so we need to be de economically decolonized and the Africans need to go back to treasure the cultural the cultural views and values that have protected us and that have kept and sustained us for generations you know things like the the value that the Africans put on motherhood things like the value they put on on larger families things like the value we put on marriage you know uh, family life the care of the elderly, multi-generational leaders. And it's not just mom, dad, and the kids. Yes. The extended multi -generational, family. Multi-generational, that's right. We live with grandmothers. Important. It is incredible. I, a, a few weeks ago, I went back to Nigeria to be at my cousin's wedding, and I was just so appreciative of, of how I, when I looked around and saw my family, my family was not just my mom and dad who were at this wedding for my cousin, but it was my aunties, my uncles, my cousins, nieces and nephews, great 
great aunts, you know, I looked around and I said to myself, this is life, you know, this is the preciousness of, of life and I'm so grateful to be African right now, I'm so yeah. grateful to be Nigerian, yeah. that we can live out this um, family union, family love, and just appreciate it. And that's what, that's what life is about for us. That's, that's what we come out of these experiences, just feeling so fulfilled, so satisfied. And we know that within our family structures, within our, our family friendships, uh, we can find a lot of strength, especially in difficult times. Yeah. So yeah, that is the African way. Yeah, it, it's, it's uh, something that, um, you know, Africa, has a lot to contribute to the exactly. whole world. Yes, we but do. But dependence on the West yeah. doesn't allow the beauty of the African culture to turn to d develop its own direction and gift. Yeah, uh, and because it's a it's a gift it that is, is distinct in the world. Yes, we have something to contribute. Absolutely. And I and I did say that in the book. We do Africans must recognize that we have something so precious. We we have a treasure within our cultural views and values. Mm -hmm. And the Africans have lost the confidence in what they have just because they keep going back to take aid, they keep going back to depend on these western nations, on these philanthropists like the Gates Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation that we lose the confidence in, in the preciousness of what we have within our families, you know, within our, you know, the fact that the Africans uh, and don't have as much a uh, high as divorce rate as other people, you know, issue, things like that, the friendships within people, trust in family, uh, and the kind of thing that we, we get within our community, our local communities, our church communities, the Africans still don't, have, still don't realize that what they have is so precious that it can be offered to the world. Exactly. Oh, thank you, Uju. Yeah. That's uh, good stuff. Again, we want to encourage you to go to cultureoflifeafrica.com cultureoflifeafrica.com and also you know I want to change subject a little bit because uh, something very significant happened today uh, with the death of Reverend Billy Graham uh, this he was one of the really great religious leaders it's interesting to me way back early in his career, he had a certain anti-Catholic quality about him. He overcame that. He left that behind and he made all kinds of appeals to people of all different religions and he encouraged them to come to know Jesus Christ across all lines and then he welcomed Catholics and various types of Protestant ministers to come in. He wasn't trying to make his own denomination with himself, even though people nicknamed him the, the Protestant Pope of America. He wasn't. He wasn't trying to be a, a, that kind of a leader. Billy Graham could have had political influence. No, he sought simply to bring people to know Christ and then sent them back to the already existing local communities to which they belonged. And I think he preached to uh, all the audiences together, added up to uh, well over 216 million people came to Billy Graham Crusades because over his 99 years, he was an indefatigable uh, evangelist. And we have much to learn from him about how to be forthright in preaching that basic gospel of Christ. And then with that conversion to Jesus, we all can come to those fine points and depth of our, uh, our love of Christ and our own church uh, and the great things that we have to offer to enrich all of that. So we want to extend our condolences to the Graham family. Uh, to all the many hundreds of millions that came to know Christ through him. And there's going to be, I'm sure, I suspect, a real big greeting for him uh, with the Lord. Lots of other people are there because of his faithfulness. And we should do the same. Well, again, thank you, June. I want to give you all a blessing. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we can do all the shows that we told you about at the beginning. We have new series coming up. We can have Uju come here to inform us about this very important work going on for Africa. And all the other shows we do on one basis, which is that the network is brought to you by you.
So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we'll keep our carbon footprint low as we pay our bills too. God bless you and thank you.